do. Oh. Ready? Um, um, uh, yeah. Yes. We have quorum. I'm about to call. All right. We'll have quorum without you. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Members and chambers. We do have quorum, so I am going to call uh, the June 20th, 2023 meeting of the Common Council Executive Committee to order and ask Karen to call the roll, please. President Curry? Here. Vice President Figueroa Cole? Alder Vitiver? Here. Alder Madison? Here. Alder Govindarajan? This way. Alder Conklin? Present. Alder Evers? Here. Alder Bennett? Here. Alder Govindarajan? Here. And Vice President Figueroa Cole was here, so I expect she'll be ER. right back. ER. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You have quorum. Thank you, Karen. Um, all right. So next our order of agenda is approval of minutes. We last met on June 6th. I'd entertain a motion. Move. So move. Move. Second. All right. Uh, Alder Bennett. Bennett. Thank you. And moving into. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, unless I see or hear otherwise, I will, what's the word? Uh, record as unanimous record consent. As unanimous consent. Mm-hmm. Seeing none, thank you for that catch, Karen. We will move on to public comments, of which I do not believe we have any registered speakers. So that takes us to the disclosures and recusals. Members of the body should make any required disclosures or recusals under the city's ethics code. Seeing none, I will just disclose. I know many of you are aware I am an employee of YWCA Madison. Um, I do not work in the restorative justice department. I work in the housing department and did not put together any of today's presentation in my YWCA role. Seeing no other, Alder Vice President Figueroa Call has returned. And that takes us to our second agenda item, which is legislative file 78457. BCC reorganization TFOG's recommendations. And I believe I'm turning that over to Deputy Mayor Baumel, who is attending virtually today. Hi there. I, I happen to have a few slides, so I'm wondering if I can share my screen. Yep, you can share your screen. Okay, great. And and you can see that. Okay, great. Um And that, are you seeing general presentation view? Yes. Okay, great. Not all the notes and all of that, just checking. Um, All right, well, thanks all for having me today. Um, I am really just giving a very high level presentation on the background of what we are talking about or looking at. If if some of you have heard us talk about reviewing uh, the BCC structure, the board committee and commission structure, where that has been, where it is right now, and what we're proposing as a structure to go forward and and give you a chance to give any ideas or input, ask any questions, because this is really just the beginning of, of, of launching a process and, and we want to just make sure that um, how we move through this is clear to you from day one and then you can in, engage and shape that how you'd like. So... Um, why are we thinking about this? So 
Um, at your last meeting, I believe Karen gave you all an update on action that has been taken to implement the TFOG's recommendations and TFOG standing for Task Force on Government Structure that met, um, I believe the final report was issued in 2019 with a number of recommendations related to how to make sure that um, government is is reaching people and engaging with people and, and performing its duties as intended Um um, whether we're talking about, you know, largely talking about equity in terms of who is served, but also in terms of efficiency. Um, so part of this is to act on recommendations from TFOGs, which I'll talk about in a second. And really, um, ultimately, we want our BCCs to provide a clear and efficient path for resident engagement and participation. And we want to be able to efficiently and effectively further the work of the city. And let me just, by way of background, give you a little more information about the findings of the TIF, the task force on government structure and what they found about city committees in 2019. So this is a, a just a kind of a bulleted list of their findings. There's more information within the report, but they found that um, our BCCs lacked geographic and racial diversity and um, there were many of them. There were a large number of, of BCCs, and that resulted in a drain on staff time, resident time, and alder time. There was They lacked consistent accountability. There was varying levels of authority and influence. Um, some had a... Did, lacked a well-defined purpose or had outlived their purpose or had overlapping purposes. Um, they required logistical processes that were not conducive to resident participation and engagement, um, showing up and getting your three, three minutes in the microphone, for example. Um, and they often were understaffed or inadequately staffed or had inadequate resources to do their work. So these were their findings and it led them to some recommendations that essentially are, they recommended reorganizing BCCs around lead committees and creating an org chart. They recommended eliminating or combining a number of, of BCCs that were redundant or overlapping or had outlived a purpose. And um, they rec they wanted reorganize they recommended reorganizing in a way to ensure BCCs were accountable to their intended purpose and functions. So since then, um, there's been a lot of discussion around this. The, their recommendations came out in 2019. And essentially the discussion since has been consistent with that, but has, to my mind, focused on ensuring the purpose and function are clear and relevant, i.e. we're looking at the right priorities. Um, ensuring activities are productive and efficient in furthering the goals of the city and making sure we don't assume that BCCs are the strongest mechanism we have for, for public engagement. So don't use them as a proxy for all of our resident engagement. So I think that's something that we well know and has and have been incorporating more and more into how we do our work for several years now. But those tend to be themes I hear highlighted as, as folks continue to talk about the future of BCCs. And I will say just to share a little more of, of data that's, that we happen to have and has come through this and that we've looked at over the last couple of years. Um, this is a chart that was created as part of the TFOGS process. Um, and it really kind of helped daylight that a lot of the issues um, are probably at least partially caused or could be partially addressed by addressing the number. So at the time of the analysis, Madison had 102 boards, committees, and commissions. That was um, 2018, 2019. And you can see a few bases of comparison here. So um, staff um, staffing the committee looked at big 10 cities. There were eight of them in the analysis. And the average number of BCCs was 30. They looked at other cities that are kind of like Madison. So capital cities, university cities, they had six of them. They found an average of 35 BCCs. And then they just looked at Wisconsin saying, well, you know, our state government structure requires certain things. We have different, every, every state, you know, regulatory functions are a little different. Maybe it's just different in Wisconsin. And they found in the eight largest Wisconsin cities, there were 25 BCCs on average. Um, and at the time of this analysis, we had 102. So you can see that um, we, we were out of scale with our peers to some degree. And uh, so that was, that was kind of fodder for maybe reducing the number of this 
uh, of BCCs does have an impact and can help further and address some of these issues. So like, for example, things you've heard me say already, the notion of a drain on staff residents and alders is partially related to the number or the inability of staff to give to give the desired level of staff support could be related to the numbers. Um, an issue of committees that may have outlived their purpose isn't because of the numbers, but it may it, it may relate to the fact that we we perhaps haven't sunsetted some or made some as permanent that could have been um, um, in a more defined timeline. And then um, I think the, the notion of giving, making it easier or giving residents a clearer and more efficient path to ensure their voices are heard in the settings they need to be heard in to getting to getting engaged in the process in the right way, um, coming to one or two meetings to, to make sure you're heard by decision makers as opposed to thinking, oh boy, this might go through six or seven committees. Do I need to be in all of them? And, and you know, that was, that's another thing that I think um, relates to the numbers a little bit. Um, just a little bit more of a breakdown. So one thing before, bef before you start doing the math of the column on the right in your own head, I'll tell you that adds up to 84. So on the last slide, when this analysis was done in 2018, 2019, there were 102 committees. In 2021, uh, council staff Karen Kapusta-Pofal broke out committees by type. And at that time, we had 84, 84 main committees. We know there were some subcommittees and working groups of committees that were not all in Legistar. So this was a count in Legistar at that time. And so we recognize that to some extent we are, we are required to have some, there are 13 committees that we're required to have by the state, uh, board of park commissioners, board of public works, finance committee, et cetera. Um, we had a number of temporary committees, ad hocs, task forces, they are time limited. We have a number that we've established ourselves, and you see I listed some there, 48 of them. Sustainable Madison Committee, Urban Design Commission, Food Policy, Housing Strategy, Landlord Tenant Issues. So there's more, many more, there's 48, but you get a sense. And then, of course, there are places where we, the city, are offered appointments to other people's committees and commissions. So this is less of a city resident engagement issue, perhaps, but it, it is, or a staffing issue, perhaps, but certainly alders or other residents are, are sitting on those seats as well. So it's a sewerage district, the Overture Center Board, for example, CARPC. And so this is kind of the basis of, of where we started with our committees. And I wanted to just share the work that's that's been happening to date. So I believe in 2020, um, the council started an implementation working group to say, okay, let's take on all of these TFOGS recommendations. They've done quite a lot of work. And again, I, I know you, you got a presentation on that at your last meeting. So there was a number of recommendations that had nothing to do with the number or structure of BCCs. And there's been a lot of work that's happened on them. Um, on the BCCs themselves, um, there's been a couple of pathways pursued, some that were just, hey, if there are some things we know we can do right away, there might be some committees that we can see pretty clearly and agree right away, we can find some efficiency. Let's not wait for a big long process to fold them into, let's just do it. So I think in 2019, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee and the Committee on the Environment um, were both um, collapsed into the Sustainable Madison Committee. And I believe I believe the Solid Waste Advisory went partially to be Board of Public Works, partially to Sustainable Madison. Committee on Environment was moved into Sustainable Madison. Um, just very recently in the last um, several months, the two transportation committees were combined and a number of parks subcommittees were, were, were combined or reduced the number. Um, and then in terms, there were a number of approaches um, kind of contemplated and thought about um, some paths kind of, there was work down one path to kind of, and, and changed our minds. We learned a lot through the process. So for example, at one point we said, let's not look at the committees that we have. Let's just imagine there are no committees and talk about how we would build them. And that, that starts with finding a common goal and purpose and work started there. Um, we have ultimately um, 
moved away from that approach because we realized there there doesn't really have to be a common purpose to all BCCs. Some are there are multiple functions that BCCs play and and should play, and then that makes sense. Um, so so we started further down a process that really only was is probably at the early idea stage, and that's where we're at right now. So that's more what I want to tell you about right now. Um, so. And that frankly started with, let's start talking to city staff more about um, what makes sense and what doesn't. And do they have ideas? Do they have recommendations? Do they have, um, um, you know, um, sight lines to issues in a way that's different than, than how um, um, all they're serving in the working group would serve? So, so um, a, a couple of alders, um, um, the mayor, myself, Karen, you know, in different ways we talked to um, some staff and it, it illuminated some things and led everybody to um, an idea that staff and particularly some of the directors are in a strong position to give some input into what they need. Like, so for, for their topic area and their position in the city and the committees that they currently have, what do they have and what do they need? And are those things well matched or is there a mismatch? And that could be a starting point for kind of starting to flesh out something for um, CCEC to react to and, and consider. So for example, some of them um, might say, I, let's take some, I, I need some, I need a body that can give input on legislative referrals. That is what I need. That is what I have. We're good. The quantity is such that we should meet monthly, just like we do. This works. In other cases, we have heard um, this body was formed to help develop a strategy or a plan and was made permanent to help guide the implementation of the plan. And sometimes we really need their input, but on a month to month basis, um, there's, you know, it, it's not necessarily a month to month thing. So I may have a monthly committee, but a quarterly committee might, might really be what I need. Um, in some cases you say, I have two committees that I need, you know, they both serve a great purpose, but you could say, would they both meet quarterly or you could combine them into one and expand their duties to cover both topics. Um, and then in others, we recognized we really are looking for an engagement um, activity. And this was created at a time that it was used as a proxy for engagement on a particular issue. We should think about whether um, a legislator created and staffed BCC is the best way to pursue that, or if we should start changing that out for something else. Should a, a, a monthly or quarterly forum on this topic in the community or in some setting where it makes sense? Um, or, you know, this is something that we created as a permanent, but probably should have made time limited. Maybe we should think about how often and in what circumstances we do put more time limited con constraints upon something or, or really um, crystallize their mission and their scope. So I don't think we're at, that's kind of the approach that it resonated with a lot of staff. It resonated with um, um, a number of, of, of former alders and, um, and I shared it with um, 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 Alder Curry and Alder Figueroa Cole as kind of the, the, the point in time that we were at as we entered this conversation in space. So um, I think there's a lot we can learn from getting either a recommendation from staff or even a couple of sets of recommendations or options from staff if there's different parameters of like we want a model that is just kind of a mild tweak or a model that really cuts these in half and you'd have to more aggressively combine. There are ways I think that staff would be able to give you some good insights into what some of those options may be that then could go forward in coordination and more input with you. Um, and to the point that they're interesting and, and, and you're receptive to them, then we could start going further in terms of what's it really mean to get existing committee input on those before finalizing them? What's it mean to um, go forward and work through the details of those? Um, what would be a logical timeline for um, 
um, turning this into um, legislation to make a change? What would be the effective date for that change? Of course, it doesn't have to happen overnight, but we're at a point of just wanting to work with um, CC, me, Karen, and CCEC to start talking to these department heads and getting some feedback and some good ideas from them, hearing what they think the opportunities are, what the strengths are, and um, also where where there might be some room for improvement and efficiency. So um, that is essentially where we are at. And my last slide is just the blank empty slide to say questions and discussion, but um, so I can go back, but, or I can just, I guess, stop sharing my screen might be the better way to go. Um, so I really just, I, I know for some people that might be repeat, um, but I wanted to just give a chance to, um, get people's thoughts on that, get people's input on that. And, um, you know, know that the goal is to work with CCEC pretty closely through this process. Thank you. Um, Alder Bennett. Yeah. Can you go back to, um, some of the previous slides, um, with like the different committees that are like, we have to have. Sure. Um, can you see this? Yeah. Did you say no? Oh, that's, that's it. Yes. That's it. Okay. And we Sorry, do. I just wanted to like, look at it. <laughs> And we do, I, I gave a couple of examples here, but we do have, you know, we have the full list of how we got to 48 um, for, you know, for the third column or how we got to 13 for the first column, or sorry, row. Um, okay. So we can share that detail too, knowing uh, just being clear that the count was done in 2021. So there may be a couple of changes that, that aren't reflected in these exact numbers. Okay. Um, I have a question about how, to go about like reducing committees specifically. Like I, I think that recommendations from staff would be immensely helpful. Um, and I think that, I mean, um, I mean, this is like comment and also discuss and also question, like the way we've been going about it, it's been kind of like a piecemeal process, like picking a couple committees, we see, oh, this should be changed. Um, and what I've noticed is that there's a lot of pushback at these committees. Um, for example, I don't mean to call any committees out, but like, you know, there's the push to have put together the landlord tenant and housing strategies. And um, that received a lot of pushback, even though the committees realistically like haven't been meeting. So, I'm just trying to understand like how to go about it and how like we will take like recommendations from the committee about structure and all of that um, into consideration at council. Yeah, I think there's probably not a one size fits all answer to that, but I think working with existing committees um, is certainly part of this, but I think it's, I think in my mind, there's, I, I, I think, and I hope that bringing it back to the goal will, will, um, will help make this, um, more clear. And, and like, if, if we, if our, if our goal is to make sure, um, you know, we can meet certain purposes of the city efficiently. If our goal is to have fewer com um, committees so that we can support them better, then we have to show what the benefit is of this, right? Everything comes with trade-offs. And um, I think if we can show some gained benefits, like if we had fewer committees, staff would be able to provide support in this way, or we could supplement engagement in this way, um, but we can only do those things if we create the space and the capacity for them and just kind of also, so that's kind of the goal. And then also make sure that particular topics don't feel targeted, that this is something we're looking at across the city and they can kind of see how they sit in, fit into the larger, 
the larger piece of this. I am hoping that that can lead to discussions that are, you know, um, um, that that committees don't. It it doesn't it doesn't like they they see how they fit in that and they can engage in, in helping us sort through that or helping us make sure we don't miss anything in terms of functions they provide and think about the best way to incorporate things together, or uh, I, some of these we might just have to wait and see how they play out. It's hard to always predict perfectly. Um, Alder Bennett, if I, if I could weigh in a, a little bit on your question, I mean the. Like the short answer, or part of the answer, I think, to your question about how is simply, you know, of course, these are all committees created by ordinance or resolution. And so the vehicle would just be an ordinance or a resolution to abolish the committee. Um, I wanted to underline one point that Deputy Mayor Baumel made, which is, you know, these are all creatures of the council. And while it may be useful to seek input from the committees, these are all decisions of the council. The, the committees do not really have you know, a say in whether or not they exist, I guess, to put it uh, bluntly, just as they don't have a say in who their appointments are. Those are all decisions of the mayor and of the council. So it is completely up to the discretion of the council um, to, you know, whether or not you generate the consensus or political will, for lack of a better word, to, to um, you know, abolish any of these committees. Um, and I think that's really been one of the sticking points is they're just not, when you get down to individual committees, there just has not been a solid consensus um, in a lot of cases that um, any of them should be um, gotten rid of. Thank you, Attorney Haas and Deputy Mayor Baumel, uh, Alder Evers. Uh, thanks. Um, there's a blank screen on. Uh, <laughs> wonder if we can. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, thanks for this. Um, I have a couple of different thoughts. I, I guess I'm really struck by the reminder of what a outlier we are regarding the number of committees with respect to other municipalities throughout the state, other comparable municipalities in other parts of the country. I had an interesting conversation with a cousin of mine who lives in Sweden, who's on the city government there, and he was amazed and with the city that think larger than Madison, they have something like 15 committees, maybe 20, and we have 100. Uh, and I appreciate what Alder Bennett says about pushback. Uh, the pushback's just human nature. People are gonna have hurt feelings perhaps. And, um, but we've accommodated that. When the Solid Waste Committee became part of Sustainable Madison, I think we changed the membership, maybe enlarged the numbers of the members of the committee and identified uh, kind of the work plan of the committee to include the topics that were formerly in the solid waste committee, including a working group within SMC to deal with those issues. I would encourage my colleagues to not really respond to sympathetically to the to that human tendency to try to hold on to a position or role because as deputy mayor Bamo says we need to keep in mind this broader goal we have way too many committees it is highly inefficient and i would suggest and in fact request if it's possible uh deputy mayor Bamo, if on those 48 committees that we created if we could get a history of those when they were created, uh, some kind of evaluation to, you know, maybe in categories, you know, can we rate them if this is effective, this this meets regularly, or this struggles to have quorum, or you know, I, I let's let's look at these forty eight because there I think is, you know, we could potentially cut those in half, and that would be a good starting point. 
And I would just ask again, staff uh, and everybody involved to 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 take a, a really sharp focus to this and not be distracted. This is way overdue. This is something that we can make progress on in this automatic term. And we ought to be able to just cut like a knife and, and rid ourselves of some of the inefficiencies in our system, freeing up staff to, to be able to do their jobs, freeing up alders and others uh, to not have to sit on committees that meet irregularly and are not really getting anything done. So I'm all for moving ahead with due haste. Sorry for the speech of mine. Thank you, Alder Evers. Alder Gov Governor Derajan. Hi, um, quick question about the org chart. It was mentioned that we want to create one. Is that already made or is that to be done? There are examples um, that are just examples that were created um, by the staff during the TFOGS process. So the TFOGS report has attached to it a couple of examples of what an org chart could look like. And so the idea there was um, the idea was a hierarchy. So um, can I think of any examples? I guess it would say something like, um, let's just take land use or something. They would say all of the other land use committees are functions of the plan commission. And then the plan commission reports to council. Um, and um, there were even ideas of maybe alders only serve on the top committee and not on all the subcommittees. Maybe that's just residents. And so that, that's certainly um, something that could be considered. Um, I didn't mean to, you know, exclude that. It hasn't been something that's been, um, um, I, I guess it, it hasn't come, I haven't heard it come up as something that alders who've been working to implement this since have um, gravitated too, but I haven't heard any pushback on it either. It just didn't seem to be um, an intention catching or a conversation starting focal area. The, the the number really seemed to be the thing people were focusing on. Okay, that makes sense. But, I, but yeah, I can I can get you a link to that if you're interested in in the examples that are in the back. I would be yes. I am okay. a nerd for charts. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Are there any additional questions? Oh, okay. I just, um, I can say a little bit more too about some of the things that Alder Evers raised because that is, I, uh, we had done some progress on that with the committees that were identified as being created by ordinance or, and or resolution. And um, it, of course, in the intervening time, we would have to update the information, but we have some data collected about things like number of referrals from council, number of um, vacancies as of whatever time you're looking at it, because that's a snapshot, um, number of, um, in, a, in a given calendar year, number of uh, cancellations. Um, so we have some, you know, we have that, that data available to us and then Obviously, you have access to the it, uh, minutes and the agenda, so we can dig in a little bit about what they were doing when they met. Um, so we do have some some work um, that had been done. It just needs to be um, updated to the current time period. Alder Evers. Thank you, and thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm wondering if we could agree on a timeline for getting that update so that um, we might be able to make recommendations and move forward. Um, if we can, do we have an idea of when we might be in a position to see that updated information? Um. I would have to, I'll, I'll put staff on it to get it done. 
I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess I would defer to President Curry on what she wants to see on the 711 and 725 agendas. Um, so I don't know that I can necessarily promise it for seven before 711, but you know. Sure. Would it be doable by August 1st or? Yeah. yeah. Is that agreeable to you, all drivers? Oh yeah, I'm just, I, I think it would be helpful if we commit, you know, if we could give ourselves a schedule and reasonable expectations, not trying to burden people unduly, but, you know, let's commit ourselves to making progress on that. And I'm just, you know, whatever time you need to do the job, but let's commit ourselves to it and bring that updated information back to us. And I like what you're saying, you know, there's a little maybe a history of these committees when they were started, what their task and purpose was, how many referrals, how many cancellations or struggles to have quorum, you know, and some other kind of, of way of determining their effectiveness and, and maybe also um, where we could see that in, in an organizational chart, how they might relate to other existing committees so we can look at possible combinations and in some instances, that might be in order. Others, it might be that they should just be deleted. That they're no longer there's no longer a purpose or a function that you know that that needs to be met. So right, I look forward to yeah discussing this further. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, if I can capture that, maybe to have at least a list for us to look at and review and ask questions, but. I'd say probably definitely before the end of this year to have a comprehensive list that hits on um, some of the feedback questions and concerns elevated by the committee and, and the body. Can I jump in? Sure. I get Alder? Alder Bennett, I'll get to you next. Karen wanted to elaborate further. Just, just real quick, I wanted to say, I think, because um, in order for things to keep moving, um, we can, we can catch up the stuff that we have to date and then start working on the longer, you know, the, the history in terms of what year things were started and so on and so forth will take a little bit longer. But we can get to you something so that you have something to work with. And then if you have more points of analysis that you want, then we can kind of build those in so that you don't have to wait. It, I'm not going to let the, uh, what is it, the perfect be the enemy? No, yes, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a super big fan of, of letting that happen. So I'm going to I'm going to get you something, and then you can use it as a starting point to discuss it, and we can go kind of go from there and build, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think it's a good starting, to have a starting point. Great. Alder Bennett, did you have a question? Uh, no, not a question. <laughs> All right, well, I think- uh, Just like a, a comment. Got it. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I, I I just wanted to make the comment that um I don't know I really am happy that we're having this discussion about organization of BCCs and I don't know maybe I'm speaking to the choir but I just really am worried if we're not very deliberate about it that um and what specific committees we are looking at that there's just going to be so much pushback. And as soon as, as soon as we pick up one committee to look at, then it's going to be a whole thing and we're not going to be able to get anything done. So that's my biggest worry is, you know, I feel like we need to be a bit more intentional with specific committees. Thank you, Alder. I feel like that was a point reiterated by Alder Evers as well. Um, and thankfully empowered by attorney Haas of sharing who actually holds the power to um, continue moving that work forward. So not seeing any other hands for comments or questions. I will move us on to our third agenda item, which is council office updates and turn it over to our chief of staff. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So again, some office updates so that you have some office, some upcoming staff out of office. I would like to um, 
put Isaac on the spot a little bit because you do have a microphone over there. Um, I'd like to welcome Isaac uh, Mathias, our new council legislative analyst. Um, I think technically if you push that button, <laughs> you can say hi to everyone. Hello everyone, it's nice to meet you all. Excited to work with you all. Thank you very much. And um, then I, I provide some, um, some reminders and tips here. Uh, I would love to, I would love everyone to, even the returning alders, to take a look at the budget videos, the brief budget overview videos that the agencies have provided on the new alder orientation channel or channel website, because the returning alders can vouch for the fact that when budget season comes, it comes really fast. And um, you don't really get a chance to breathe until you're kind of through it. So I would recommend um, taking a look at those videos. Sometimes looking at the giant budget book is overwhelming. It's, you know, yeah. <laughs> so this is another sort of point of um, context. So if you haven't already looked at the videos for this, you know, if you want to focus on the budget videos first, that's that makes sense. Um, there's going to be more videos coming in with inf more information on agency's major initiatives, so you'll get a little bit more background there too. So I just wanted to put a plug in because I I I know I mean and and maybe somebody can back me up here, but you know from what, from what I can tell from experience, it is um, it can be quite overwhelming, especially the first couple budgets. Um, another thing that we're going to no, I can't for some reason. My screen is not responding. Oh, right here. Okay. Uh, another thing that I would like to um, let you all know is that we've noticed um, increased interest in creating resolutions, and we've noticed an uptick in neighborhood meeting requests. And so as we're getting Isaac trained in and how to help draft resolutions, um, and also just considering the timing, um, the days leading up to council agenda generation, and, and if anybody wants a you know, step-by-step -step description of that, they can certainly come reach out to me or Liz, um, does end up being rather hectic. And so what we're finding is that in order to do the best job we can for you, if we could get a little bit more lead time on any um, resolutions that you submit to us if possible. I gave some example deadlines so you can kind of see what that looks like in practice. Um, this also allows us to deal with emerging situations better because it's one thing to deal with one or two emer emerging situations um, and it's another thing to deal with five or six emerging situations you know so <laughs> it's 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 our hope to, we're just trying to pace things out or sort of separate things out enough to be able to manage that um, that workload because what happens is that there will be things we would want to find out from staff or um, some of the alders we need to track down information we need to approve you know get approval on edits from lead sponsors maybe we need to do a little research maybe some other thing happens maybe somebody gets sick in the middle of it and and, and that throws off our our our, um, um, our momentum, and so this would give us a little bit more time to um, to help you out. It's kind of like the three the rationale for the three the three week uh, guideline that we've been um, asking for neighborhood me meetings. We're kind of asking for something. It's not three weeks, but for the same basic reason. So I wanted to. Um, call your attention to that. And then I, I just wanted to call your attention to some trainings. That I, I try to do this every time. There are some listed still that I recommend from last time, but there's going to be a disability summit at the end of July. And this is a new, um, a new offering that DCR is, the Department of Civil Rights is offering. And I wanted to highlight this for folks because um, it is new content and I think it, it might be you know, something that you all would find very useful. So I just wanted to highlight that. So I'm not sure if anyone has any questions for me about anything, but I am happy to answer them. Not seeing any, thank you so much. Um, and that was also emailed to Alders um, if you weren't able to follow along with the screen share. Moving along. We will move into our fourth agenda item. Uh, yes. 
which is a presentation from YWCA Madison, Restorative Justice Learning. We do have Eugenia Highland Granados with us. Eugenia, if you want to come up, either of the podiums have the microphone. We'll turn them on for you. Um, should the, would the presentation be? Yeah, I'm yes. going to hopefully um, get this to screen share. I think we got it. Okay. So just let me know as you go through and I'll. Yeah, if you can go to the first, first slide. That's not the first slide. No. So I have to use this, right? Okay, because it's like too low. Put it here or something. Oh, I can also do this. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, now? Yeah. Hello. Uh, welcome. Uh, buen día. My name is Eugenia Highland Granados. I use she, ella, to pronouns. And uh, I am director of the Restorative Justice Department for the YWCA. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for your service and the amazing work that you all are doing and for the invitation. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about our, well, our department, Restorative Justice. And so as a way to introduce a, an invitation, uh, to participate in a restorative justice experience, learning and unlearning with us, uh, my invitation from uh, Al Madam Elder Curry. I'm like, no tiles. <laughs> Sounds super cool. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go through it. Uh, please, you know, be free to ask me if you have any questions or anything, and also from a. Uh, Alder Figueroa also invited us to do this and everything. So really excited about being here. And uh, yeah, so the next one, why do you see a Madison? Uh, the next one, then we can go to the next one. Yeah. So our mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. We do this work through three, through these three main umbrellas: race and gender equity, job training and transportation, and housing and shelter. Uh, the restorative justice work that we do is under the umbrella of race and gender equity. Uh, this started happening at the YWCA after our racial justice summit. The community wanted to know how to reduce racial disparities within the juvenile justice system. And that's how we found out that restorative justice is actually eliminating and doing that, not only here, but around the world. I'm on the next one. Um, to start up, I would like to start up with this quote from uh, Fania Davis, who uh, is Angela Davis' sister and the leader in restorative justice here in the United States. Um, Sort of justice for her is a justice that seeks not to punish but to heal, a justice that is not about getting even but about getting well, a justice that seeks to transform broken lives, relationships, and communities rather than damage them further, a justice that seeks reconciliation rather than a deepening of conflict, a justice that seeks to make right the wrong rather than adding. Oui. I lost it. Rather than adding to uh, the original wrong, a healing justice rather than punishing justice, a restorative justice rather than the retributive justice. Um, so uh, our uh, justice system wants to, has, as she says, shows people who did wrong that wrong is wrong by hurting them again. So restorative justice what is trying to disrupt that cycle of harm. We can go to the next one. Um, it's another way to look at it is looking at the questions that it responds. So punitive or retribution, punitive justice, uh, responds, what rule was broken? Who did it? And what punishment do they deserve according to a book? Um, restorative justice responds, who has been harmed, impacted by what happened and how? What are their needs and responsibilities for everybody impacted? 
and how do all impacted come together to address needs and responsibilities and heal the harm as much as possible. Um, the next one. Uh, in YWCA Madison, we, with everything that we do, we utilize our multidimensional approach. If you have participated in a racial justice summit, you have seen this diagram before. Uh, but all our programming is embedded within this holistic model of how our own behavior impacts the relation, our relationships and how that impacts organizational cultures and how that impacts the structural society. And it goes also informing back into uh, to organization, relationships, and our own identity of who we are. Um, in the restorative justice work that we do, we do work in the education, in the community, and also uh, by doing professional development, utilizing this model of learning and unlearning and holistic approach. Next one. So a little bit of our department. Um, we partner with MMSD. We support three middle schools, Cherokee, Black Hawk, and, J and James C. Wright. We also partner with Monona Grove with the Liberal Arts School. Next one. We do work in the community in partnership with different municipalities, then County Department of Human Services in collaboration with Briar Patch. This is very important because this is an initiative that is started here in the city of Madison and it's leading this work actually around the country. So for any youth from 12 to 16 years old who, who qualifies for a municipal citation, non-traffic, is referred to restorative justice and have no record upon completing a restorative justice process. We also work with the municipal courts. Judge um, Judge Cobel refers youth to, to restorative justice processes instead of fines or other type of punishments. Uh, next one. Uh, we, I, we wanted to show some data. Uh, there is a pre-pandemic and post-pandemic data, right? So we also wanted to emphasize that. In 2019, we received around 641 police referrals to restorative justice. 505 opted in, restorative justice is voluntary, so the, the youth are not forced to participate in restorative justice. They voluntarily choose to participate in restorative justice. 83% of these referrals were youth of color. 46 municipal court referrals. The rate, 35 from that number were referred again, so that's 5%, and 95% were not referred again. We can see that with restorative justice across the world, the, um, the rate of recidivism is super, super low. Um, for 2022, the referrals have gone down to approximately 114. So we started, when we started this program, we were receiving 800 referrals. Now we are receiving 114, and that is great that youth are not receiving tickets, they are not being uh, ticketed, and they're not having anything on their record. The next one. Thank you. We also with our pro have been progress with our collaboration with MPD. Uh, that develop, this is unique in the whole country. There is a system that has been developed within MPD that every youth who is referred to restorative justice automatically goes to this like alternative system. So their names never get into the system. So there is really no ghost or record or nothing. What we found is that even though their records were clean, there was still like a, like a ghost in the system. So youth who wanted to, they were applying, for example, for immigration processes or youth who wanted to join the military, they, they, they would reach back to us years after because there was still in this in this record. So with the collaboration of MPD, we could figure it out how to create like an alternative system and uh, where there's an event, but there's no name tied to an event. So there's like really nothing in the record. So the next one. 
And this is very important because this is an appreciation to this, uh, to this body of governance. Um, in 2021, a Madison City resolution was passed that integrates this process into how we officially respond to youth and makes it the first option and not an alternative to municipal court. So every youth, no police discretion, gets offered restorative justice process whenever they qualify for a municipal citation. And they would have to request court. So before it was the other way around. Restorative justice was the alternative to court. But now court is the alternative to restorative justice, which is huge. And this resolution was passed through here, endorsing all aspects of the restorative justice programs and encouraging MPD to take necessary ste steps to expand these programs. That has also um, reinforced our collaboration. And we are now trying to ex expand into more municipalities. We are in San Prairie. We are in, um, we are in Middleton. We are in Cross Plains. Uh, we expanded to the sheriff's jurisdiction. And and we, we have a lot of support also from MPD into like doing this expansion into other municipalities. The next one. And this is really important because harm, harm is part of the human experience. We are not gonna stop, you know, harm happening, but we can prevent violence from happening. We can change the way that we respond to harm. We can heal from harm. Um, so we do work in the community through restorative justice communities of practice. So we bring restorative justice knowledge and practices to the community and how so that the youth can learn about what is restorative justice to build more connection, to build an understanding of our interconnection, to rehumanize each other through these processes that are really important before harm happens. So that when harm happens, we know how to respond to it in a way that brings us closer but not pushes us apart or replicates a harm that we have been impacted by. So we do this in the community. We are receiving referrals instead of police referrals. Now the community is reaching out to us, especially the community sites that we partner with, Meadowood, Kennedy Heights, Southside. We are starting a super soon a partnership with Bayview also and hoping to expand into other community sites. And uh, we do this by empowering youth and families education so that we can heal, we can resolve our own issues and our own conflicts and our own harm and hurt and trauma. Um, yeah, and we also support community sites to develop restorative justice philosophy and practices within their, their own community sites. Next one. And we, we also teach, we engage with communities in learning and unlearning about what this is. And this is part of the invitation that uh, it's coming to you all, to engage in the understanding, the learning, the unlearning, and to better understand how to influence right, the uh, policy and uh, to open up for more of this to, to happen in our community. And uh, yeah, the next one. Our model is a circle process. We also have other different tools like conversations. We also have like uh, like charts and flow charts and all that. But I just wanted to show you this image. This image is a restorative justice circle led by youth in our city. And they chose what they wanted to connect about. about. These are eighth graders. They are circle keepers. They became circle keepers when they were in sixth grade. And they, they are the leaders in their schools. Circle keepers are the leaders in their schools that resolve conflict, that bring the community together, and uh, that are, you know, like uh, dismantling punitive practices that are restoring and healing and disrupting harm in their own school community. So this is an example of how a circle looks like, how youth get together to understand, to reflect, to connect, to rehumanize each other, not only youth, but adults. We have found that adults, we need these processes a lot to build our relationships, to understand how to influence the spaces that we have a huge impact and a huge power. The next one. 
So uh, to start wrapping it up, uh, I would like to show a really short clip uh, from uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, uh, who spoke at the YWCA National Conference in Washington, D.C. And she frames, uh, she loves uh, to do policy work. And she says that policy is a love language. It's her love language to the community. And, uh, and she talks about how uh, policy and restorative justice, you know, work, the importance of like working together with that understanding. And yeah, let's show the clip. I hope it is. I'm, I'm going to ask um, media team, I'm, uh, I'm going to press the button and then I'm going to go to minute one, one minute 144. And hopefully there'll be sound on your end because I clicked to share sound, but I, okay. I may be wrong. So I'm just going to yeah. see what I can do here. It's in the one hour and 44 minutes. Oh, one hour 44. One hour and 44 minutes. You have to go. And 40 seconds. <laughs> there. Social justice is an intersectional struggle. It extends to our education system where discriminatory school disciplinary policies are disproportionately targeting black and brown girls, LGBTQI students, and those with disabilities which is why I'm grateful for all of you because I believe in practicing what I call cooperative governing. It is because of your partnership that I was able to introduce the Ending Push Out Act, one of the first bills that I introduced to disrupt the school to confinement pathway by establishing trauma-informed policies in schools and those wraparound services so that our students, despite the efforts of some of my colleagues across the aisle, will have guides instead of guards will have trauma-informed educators and social workers and nurses and mental health clinicians that when a child is going through it, instead of asking them what is wrong with you, will ask you what happened to you. I'm wrapping up. The Ending Push Out Act will put an end to zero tolerance policies and instead promote restorative practices, move away from hiring police in schools and move towards investing in those counselors, social emotional wellness and mental health services. And finally, as I close, yesterday I was um, with some of my partners and siblings in the work of uh, ending and challenging, taking on a rape culture and fighting for survivor's justice. I'm a survivor of a near decade of, of childhood sexual abuse and also campus sexual assault. And I talked about how uh, the very first time that I knew that I was not alone and, and the vile, vile things that were happening to me at home was when I read Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. That book saved my life. We have got to stop banning books and instead provide educators with the tools they need to foster supportive and inclusive, representative, accurate, and inclusive learning environments. So here's what I know, y'all. I know that another world is possible, and I believe in the strength of this movement and the sisterhood to build it. And finally, I want to give you all a gift. I'm an Aquarius. Shout out to all the other Aquariuses here. <laughs> And I love a good affirmation. And uh, I have a sibling in the movement, many of you know her, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, uh, who gifted me with a very powerful affirmation throughout the pandemic uh, that I still carry with me and say every day, and I wanna gift it to you. It is that I choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism, and I choose fortitude over fatalism. Family, I love you. Onward. And the last slide. There is one last slide. Yeah.
Thank you. And uh, this is the restorative justice definition that our department has co-created. Um, it, uh, can I ask elders to like read some pieces or do I have to, or is that possible? If they would like? Okay, just to have a little bit of participation would be great. <laughs> so I would I like to ask three people to read the three paragraphs. Thank you, yeah, go ahead. I feel so excited. All right, restorative justice is an anti-racist and decolonizing movement rooted in indigenous knowledge that recognizes the interconnectedness, value, and intrinsic va worth of all parts of creation. It aims to interrupt and dismantle the cycle of harm through the medicine of collective radical vulnerability and love. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Restorative justice is abolitionist. It recognizes the need to heal, repair, and transform the historical and transgenerational harm from our society's practices and systems of retributive and unjust law embedded in white supremacist, here, hetero, patriarchal, and capitalist culture. culture. And the last one? Restorative justice is about nurturing relational, interconnected cultures and empowers communities to meet our needs and mend the relationships that make us whole. So restorative justice is really, really powerful. And as much as I can explain as much as I did what it is, give definitions and give you data of how impactful it processes are, there is no better way to understand what it is than to experience it. And that is why uh, you are gonna be receiving an invitation to participate as part of your retreat in a circle experience, at the same to continue just a little piece of learning and unlearning about what restorative justice is. And and um, so that we can continue to explore what, how, you know, policy is a love language, how Ayanna Presley has said it. And support, continue to supporting us because we have been able to get to where we are and to expand the Reserve Justice Program also because of your all support in moving policy forward. Um, but there's still a lot <laughs> that we can continue to do, right? And how to have a mindset, a restorative mindset that would not only influence your relationships, but it will influence the, the decisions making that you're making around anything, right? Who is impacted? What's the story? Um, how can we all repair to the best possible? And uh, so also bringing the restorative lens to your own role here in the city council and in your life. I personally practice, I'm a restorative practitioner and I'm a restorative, restorative parent, right? So how do I also live by these values in my whole life and my relationships? And that's it, thank you. I think that I'm gonna be taking questions if there are any questions. Wrong button. Alder Gov 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 Derajan. Thank you. Um, amazing presentation. I am honestly kind of amazed by what all of you do, and I really appreciate all the work you guys do. Um, quick question. This is for everyone under 18, year old, 18 years old, correct? Is there a possibility UW students are included in this at all? Um, so our program serves a youth from 12 to a 16 years old and 17 years old too, uh, we have it like open. And uh, in terms of like the referrals and community referrals and all that, uh, it would be great to partner with the university. It would be amazing. We've been in conversations about how to bring this to you to the university and how to like make it in a way that students most impacted by harm and structural harm, right, are at the center of any restorative justice work that happens within the university. So that that would be great to bring it to the to the university. Okay, awesome. Um, we'll talk more. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, comment? Around? Are you running right out? No, no. I'm staying a little. Okay. Yeah. All right.
Okay, so you're all gonna be receiving an invitation. I hope, this is a voluntary experience, so I really hope that you all um, come. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry. It's not, yeah, you're gonna love it. <laughs> no one says I didn't love it. There, that doesn't happen, never, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eugenia. And thank you all. Yeah, thank, oh. you for thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you again for your service. Thank you. I will just make a couple comments if that's OK. And then we can get ready to adjourn. Um, thank you for uh, the presentation. Obviously, in my disclosure, I uh, said that I work at YWCA Madison and um, have experienced restorative justice to be transformative in my whole life and practice, um, <clears throat> but got really excited. So the video clip that was just shown was captured last week, two, almost two weeks ago, it's coming up, um, at a YWCA USA uh, conference in Washington, D.C. that happens biannually. Um, and Ayanna Presley or Congresswoman Presley is, is one of my fans, uh, or I'm a fangirl, I should say, of her. And so to hear her speak, I watched the longer clip and I can share it with anyone if interested, but to hear her talking about restorative justice in terms of policy, policy creation, policy decision um, and revision, um, and knowing what we were just talking about regarding the BCC restructure um, and the point that struck out to me was regarding um, our core values. I know Alder Madison brings us to those often in her public, in her comments during discussion, but around equity, inclusion, um, and belonging. And so um, specifically looking at restructuring our BCCs and even at the top of all of our agendas, um, it's, I didn't print the first page of mine, but who is most impacted, who isn't at the table. And so um, we'll extenuate uh, Eugenia's invitation to at least um, be curious about restorative justice as a practice and how it may be able to be incorporated um, in making better decisions that line up with our city's core values. So thank you. Attorney yeah. Hatch? Um, I just, I've been asked a couple of times by a couple of alders, um, I don't know how far along this planning is for a council retreat, but I just want the council to be aware that th that has to be an open meeting. There isn't any exception for the council to have a retreat in closed session. Um, so uh, as you think about what is going to happen at the retreat, then restorative justice circles and things like that. I, uh, I just want to make sure that people are aware of that. Alder Madison? If, if we noticed a side meeting within the retreat, does that too, like a smaller, like three alders, I, I don't know. Like I'm just thinking if there were breakoffs in a restorative conversation happening, is there a way to, to do that within the retreat and it not be open, I guess, potentially? Uh, possibly, I, uh, I mean, we'd have to think about that if there's, <clears throat> you know, if it's part of that uh, retreat meeting, it might be difficult to do that. I mean, it, it, it sounds like the idea is what matters is the topic that's being discussed. And if I have this right, then the part of the purpose of the discussion is to talk about things that have occurred on the council floor or between alders, it would be difficult, I think, to justify under the open meetings law that that should be in closed session. Uh, you know, I haven't really thought about if you keep it to three members, um, maybe that's something we could look into. I, the only reason I bring it up is just in case there are and maybe it's just not part of the retreat and needs to happen outside of it. But when you're talking about something that's sensitive and you don't want to name folks, you know, it could be very, so then it, be, it, it gets to the point where it defeats the purpose of restorative justice because you can't have that conversation. Okay, let me stop. Thank you, Alder Madison, and thanks, Attorney Haas. Um, Eugenia wanted to make a comment because this is something that we discussed in our consultation as well. 
Yes, so uh, no, like we are not doing this experience to repair something or any, no. This is sort of, there is the, the like, a, like in dominant, like um, the dominant understanding of restorative justice is that can only happen after something happens that need to be repaired. And uh, but restorative justice circles are to build also relationships and connections. So if we experience anything, it would not be in response to something that happened. And but it would be if we experience something, it would be in and with the intent to build relationships. Yes. So yes, exactly. That's I I I think that anything. Uh, that would be needed to repair anything, no? That would be a different process, that would definitely require a different space and everything, but the intent for this is to experience the power of circle that brings people together, rehumanize each other, and to continue to understand what is restorative justice and how it could incorpor be incorporated into policy. So it is like a learning and experience. It's not going to be the main, you know, it's just a little bit of everything. And uh, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Um, if I could add something to part of um, Eugenia's presentation was about the training and learnings that uh, her, she and her team lead within the community. And part of when they, um, set up a proposal to do any type of search. It's, it's not anything that happens immediate. There's always consultation, um, even when we're talking about folks where harm has been, um, has happened. I've seen it where they meet with both individuals or multiple individuals separately to make sure that having the circle itself won't create more harm. Um, so that is something that is intentionally being included, um, but absolutely needs to, um, be front and center that it would be publicly noticed. Um, one other thing, like I don't know if this is appropriate to add, but I know that there have been um, other iterations of retreats uh, with council members and were publicly noticed and was informed by staff that no one showed up. Obviously it wouldn't be recorded. Um, so just to add a, a little um, maybe assurance for those who would be uncomfortable um, being in a space knowing that it'd be publicly noticed. Right. I don't see any other hands for questions or comments. I know Eugenia said she would be able to stay around for a little bit, but that takes us to our last agenda item of uh, future agenda items. I want to bring to your attention and thank Alder Govindarajan um, for asking, hey, where's the Alder intern <laughs> um, presentation? We were planning to have on today's agenda, but wanted to make sure we had time um, to include the restorative justice presentation. So we will have the Alder intern presentation and um, introduction of what staff have compiled at our next meeting on July 11th. Um, in summarizing our conversation around BCC reorganization and TFOG's recommendation, um, Karen and council staff will be working collectively to create a, a list for the CCEC to work off of and expand. Um, I'm forgetting, I didn't bring my notes from last meeting, but are there? I think the 25th we'll try to do social media, have that social media pilot update and next steps on that subject. Okay, and then at the July 25th meeting, um, should be in position to have the social media um, pilot program? Yeah, talk about next steps for the pilot. Next steps, yeah. next steps for the pilot um, for social media. Alder Govindarajan. I'm sorry, I'm feeling talkative today. Um, I don't remember the, the date, but there was also something about the Alder pay increase, correct? Yes, that is an item that uh, the committee has expressed interest in taking up this cohort. Don't have a timeline on that yet, but we'll have one for next meeting. Thank you. Alder Madison? Is it also possible to, just to get an update on where we're at in working with, uh, I think it's Officer Dukers, is that it? For uh, training for Alder's count or mayor's office or whomever else is interested. Just where the, where, where the conversations are now. Uh, those we can have, we can working with folks who might be uh, 
Um, might have a closed mm -hmm. session conversation. It, it's being worked on, Alder, and I think considering the nature of some of the incidents and training that we want to have alders to have um, would prefer for those, conver at least the conversations about next steps and planning and consultation and in close session. All right. Any other questions, additions? A great working list already. Yeah. We have some, have some from last week, but there weren't dates on. Okay, so, so I um, look forward for the on the meeting minutes for today's note. Uh, Karen will add um, some of the items that were requested. I think at last meeting by uh, committee members and um, our peers as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, with that being said, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. Mm. All right. Thank I'll you. To adjourn. <laughs> We have a, a move a motion and a second. Thank you, Alder Evers, and thank you everyone. That is the end of our Oh. I always forget that. Well, we have to vote on that. Well, I will consider unanimous consent unless I hear or see otherwise. I saw a finger, don't you dare? No. <laughs> thank you folks, we're adjourned.